I'm Philip Wright. I advise farmers on soils, structure and cultivations. And we're here today at uh, Cookswold, North Lincolnshire, to look at uh, aspects of remediation following pigs. And we're going to look at soil structure, how to identify problems, how to identify the key depths, and then how to remediate some of the issues that we find in the field. So when assessing a field uh, to decide the type of cultivations to, to, to consider, the depths and, and extent of the cultivations, it's very important really to start by looking at the, the surface of the field and seeing if there are any big differences. For example, you can see behind me here, we've got a big difference between the turning headland of the field and the rest of the field. So that's inevitably going to imply that it may be we do different depths of cultivation because the extent of the damage is different. And it's important not to over cultivate to go too deep, particularly when soil loosening, because that costs a lot of, of diesel, a lot of effort. And more importantly, when you go too deep, you're actually working into uncompacted soil at depth, which can squeeze that up against the problem, which can be a counterproductive action. So, the first stage really is to, is to look at the field, assess different extremes of the problem and go and dig a few holes and, and actually decide on the, uh, on the actual depth to cultivate too. Okay, so pretty basic one this, how to dig a hole. Obviously choose an area of the field that's in this case quite compacted. When you're digging, try and dig just two faces. So you leave yourself two faces to examine because we're going to compress these faces quite, quite a lot with a spade, which is going to make a difference to the actual structure. So <coughs> leave yourself a couple of faces. It's the classic really. We're not digging a fence post hole, going all the way around it. We're just trying to keep to two sides with a digging. As you progress deeper, you'll start to feel the soil getting a little bit looser, probably getting to the extent <coughs> and depth of the problem. If you dig holes when it's dry, the soil will be, will be strong and it'll be more difficult to dig anyway because it's dry. Uh, so you've got to remember that when you're looking at the structure. In an ideal world, you're best off digging really when the soil is at field capacity because any, any sort of layers that are formed through compaction will be shown up by water running across and out of those layers. Now it's drier, it's very much more difficult to see that. So we're relying really on the visual appearance of the soil, what the porosity looks like, and obviously the presence and extent of any roots that are in there. So we're in a compacted part of the field here, and it's quite easy to spot layers, platy layers of soil, where the soil breaks, breaks away in little plates, as you can see here, horizontal fissures showing that generally the structure is compacted. When the soil starts to break away more vertically, as it will start to as I go deeper in the hole, particularly down here, the strength gets less, slightly moister, but the soil starts to break away more vertically. And if we look at the porosity, although it's not immediately obvious, it's probably slightly more porosity down here than there is in these layers at the surface where it's very, very tight and the porosity is very low. So if you've got low porosity, you see how it's breaking away horizontally here. It's telling us that naturally any fissures, any soil, any water movement, any root movement will be horizontal through the soil as opposed to vertical. So. What we're trying to get to is a structure that will absorb the water and hold on to it, almost act like a sponge. So we need porosity to do that and we need openness and a, and a, and a lack of this 
horizontal platiness, which you can see here in the surface uh, quite clearly actually here, where whenever I move the soil, it's trying to break away horizontal. Here, as I come deeper, it starts to break away more vertically. That's indicating that the extent of this trafficking damage is not that great really. It's quite, it's quite shallow. It's, it's within the top 15, maybe 20 centimetres. Okay, so quite a contrast here. Again, similar uh, chalky sandy loam soil, but very much less compacted. This is an area of the field that's not had very much in the way of trafficking or compaction. We do get just that normal tendency of these soils to run together on the surface, but overall you can see that the structure is breaking away very easily. There's some reasonably good porosity for the type of soil it is. There's some roots in here. We've got some earthworm channels, and you can see possibly here on a, a piece I've, I've just dug away, we've got, we've got some earthworms working in there, and you can see just how easily that soil breaks apart and some good pores, some good little holes created by both worms down there and also roots which help to hold the soil apart and together. They do both things right near the surface. Again, you can probably see there some good little porous holes there where smaller earthworms have, have, have come to the surface and they've started to take, take, take into the surface, the surface residue here that's, that's, that's about. So where you've got structure like this, there's really no point in upsetting it by doing extensive moving because you're going to destroy a lot of these natural channels that are there in the first place that are giving you good pathways. So sometimes less is more. Uh, you don't need to do anything more than necessary. So if, the, for example, the machine was set to do the job we found on the headland, which would be down to about 20, 23, 25 centimetres deep to get under that compaction. If we did that here, we'd be wasting our time because the soil is in very good condition. So we, we, we've dug here in a, a pretty good part of the field, very little damage, and only probably a metre away, we've got a trafficked area, which is extending down, down slope to quite a distance. And it's a, it's a very fair point that where you have trafficking runs down slope, there's a, there's a tendency then for water to, to start to run and start to erode and create all the problems that we're trying to avoid. So it's, if it's possible to try and avoid direct downslope runs or if you've got to do them, try and intercept them with, with some cross cultivations of some description to try and avoid a big amount of water running downhill. So again, a third, a third hole just to assess the effect of this of this compacted area compared to the non. I guess you can probably see immediately this platy type effect here. It's where that classic platy, platy structure. By the time we get to the, the bottom of the spade, we've lost that. So it's a, a, a relatively shallow effect possibly extending no more than 100, 120 millimetres. So we've got very marginal, we've got slightly more severe, and then we've got a very severe effect on the headland. So you've got to sort of take a view now as to how you set the machine. I'm not expecting you to set the machine continually differently for every single distinct part of the field. But I think if, if, you, if you were to set it to take alleviate this type of depth of a problem, you, you'll cope with most of the, of the body of the field. And then when we're on the headland, I would strongly suggest resetting the machine to do a specific job on the headland, go deeper there to accommodate that problem. So when cultivating at a particular depth, the other thing that's very important to consider is the moisture content of the soil at the depth you're moving it down to. And when you're digging and checking those depths, basically just grab a lump of soil from the depth that you need to work, roll it between the palms of your hands and see, gauge the moisture content of that soil. 
you can see here as I'm rolling it, it's, it, it's crumbling, it's on the edge of crumbling. So that's what we would call friable. Uh, it's not for, for forming a long plastic worm, it's, it's quite friable. So it's going to be in a, in a moisture state that's going to break up and, and start to reduce uh, in size and start to reduce the large compacted uh, clods and lumps. If instead of that nice crumbly friable nature, when you, when you start to roll it out, you get this type of action where it's a, basically staining your hand and it's forming a long plastic worm, then unfortunately the moisture is too high, it's too wet to do effective loosening. At this moisture status, the, the soil is going to fail by compression. It's going to compress together when you try and move it with metal, as opposed to fracture and move apart and shatter and give you, and give you a, a soil that roots can get down through. This will be very, very more likely to compress. And as a result of that, there is no point in doing that operation at the time. The only effective operation I would suggest you consider, and not on these soils, would be to mould rain when soil is of this cons moisture consistency. So we're setting this machine now for the conditions we saw in the main part of the field. So we're asking it to go about 15 to 20 centimetres in depth, 150 to 200 mil deep to just get below that layer where we found in that wheeled area in the field was, was, was down to that depth. And there's a little bit of trial and error here. We've got the machine on the tractor. You need to set the roller at the back here to, to determine your depth. And, and possibly the way to start is number one, get the machine level, which is a top link adjustment. We're very fortunate here to have a hydraulic top link so it makes things very easy. Uh, lengthen or shorten the top link to, to get the, the frame of the machine horizontal to the ground so that the front tines more or less are working at the same depth as the back tines and their lifting angle is, is what the manufacturer would want for a start. We can then play around with that a little bit. If we want less surface heave or disturbance we can lengthen the top link to, to reduce that lifting angle slightly or we can go the other way just marginally. It's the benefit of having a twin row machine parallel beams we can we can use the top link to quite good effect where you've got a, a machine in a V format which we'll look at subsequently that's not quite as easy because if you alter the angle from horizontal you make the outermost tines work at a significantly different depth to the to the innermost central ones but here we've played around with the top link and we've got a, a reasonably effective job at depth across the width. We haven't quite moved all the soil, but we've been going very slowly. And I think the thing to do with this type of machine now is go at two or three different speeds up and down the field and judge the finish and judge the movement across. And you will find the best speed for the finish you want and even not particularly aggressively boiled finish if that's the requirement, but fast enough to shift the soil across the full width to depth. Uh, so we'll do some runs now at various different speeds and show you the different effects that we get on the surface. A few features about this type of machine. Basically, you've, you've got two, two beams with the tines on. The tine spacing uh, can vary a little bit machine to machine, somewhere between 35 and 40 centimetre centres. And basically, it's a relatively low rake angle point here, so we're not aiming to boil the soil too much to the surface. The leg itself has got a little twist on it to try and encourage when soil fractures from the, the leading part of the point, it fractures at about 45 degree to the surface. And the aim of this leg is to run into that fracture zone so that we're not, as you do with a vertical leg subsoiler, we're not trying to hit undisturbed land face on. So the aim is to try and reduce surface disturbance a little bit. We've got two rows, so we can 
We can play around a little bit with the, with the pitch. If we want a slightly steeper rake angle, we can shorten the top link and give ourselves a little bit more lifting action, a little bit more penetrating action into tough conditions. We show you that on the headland. But here it's doing a, a fairly effective job in one pass. We've tried different speeds, four, six, eight, 10 K, uh, just to see the effect that that has on the surface and through to depth. And the biggest effect that's having I'll show you in a little while, is, is the, 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 the disturbance and the soil movement across the profile improves as you go faster. The whole thing is controlled in terms of its depth by the roller, simple pin adjustment, so if you want to go deeper you just lift the pins up. So looking at a, a different soil loosening machine, a V-framed uh, subsoiler here, wing tines, uh, spaced a little further apart than the previous example net, but uh, they've got wings on, so we, we're doing a lot, we're basically doing a lot more of the soil movement with the wing and using the point just to gain entry in the soil, as opposed to the previous machine where the point effectively was doing almost everything now. This is purely getting us entry and we're doing the lifting effect by the wings. So this, this machine will be capable of, of lifting the headland in one pass, um, but obviously very important then, it, it's a question of having, having the machine so we can lift the headland at the appropriate depth, but also making that adjustment so we don't waste time, fuel and effort going too deep in the rest of the field. So um, it's still important to, to check out the depths and even more important, once the machine's been pulled through to check the effectiveness and make sure again we've done the job at depth. Um, the, the principle on a V form uh, gives some advantages in terms of the fact we're progressively loosening the ground so any, any interaction between the tines is, is minimised, we're not squeezing the soil between tines. The way that the twin beam machine did that was to have two beams so that we didn't have the tines too close together. Uh, because we've only got effectively one beam, the stagger helps in that respect. And it also helps to move the tines away from the wheels of the tractor because they're, they're further back as they're wider apart. And, and this really is, is the, the, the one thing that you have to remember with a V4 machine. If you, if you operate it with a top link other than leaving the, de the chassis dead level, you'll put the outermost tines in a lot deeper than the centre one uh, or shallower depending on whether you lengthen or shorten the top link. So it is important to run these with the chassis and frame running level wherever possible, um, whereas the double beam machine we can tweak around a little bit according to conditions to achieve what we want. There is a relationship with all tyne machines uh, in terms of the, the, the correct spacing for the working depth and if you, if you have a machine without wings, just chisels like the last machine, you would normally multiply the working depth by one and a half to get the centers between adjacent tines. If you put wings on, you can increase that to twice the working depth as a center. So if we were working at 30 centimeters deep with either machine, technically the other machine should be 45 centimeter tine centers and this one should be 60 centimeter tine centers. If we pre-work in front of that to, to take away some of the requirement of these tines, we could increase that ratio to two and a half to one. So a, a 30 centimetres deep would be near a 700, seven, just over 700 millimetres, 70 centimetre centres. The angle of the wing, the, uh, the, the actual lift angle of the wing, the rake angle, it's important to have a relatively low rake angle. The steeper the angle of lift, the more compression you give the soil as a result of that, when soil gets wetter, the more compression will tend to squeeze it and close the pores up. So you want a relatively low rake angle, which is, is affording more upward force than it is forward force. And both of these have a relatively low rake angle forwards, and it's very important to achieve that, even if it means, if you're not working quite as deep, that you relocate the wings to make them a little bit shallower, uh, rather than have a steep wing, because that really does increase the boil near the surface, the draft and the uh, the ineffectiveness, if you like, of leaving that level finish on top. A few final um, features of both these tines and tines in general. If you look at the, the wear shin part up the front, 
you can see this one's inclined rearward, so we've got a slight lifting effect, whereas without the wear here, this one's actually inclined forwards and is very narrow, um, almost like a knife blade. And a, a forward inclined uh, wear shin does actually help to keep the surface disturbance down and the width of the wear shin also is important. The narrower again, the more it becomes a knife, the better it is. And the same applies to any tine. If you really want to minimise surface disturbance, and this is very relevant with grassland, then preceding the, the tine with a disc, with a vertical cutting disc, to cut the surface of the ground so that it can part around the tine, as opposed to being lifted and boiled up the front of the tine, minimises any surface heave and actually keeps that surface intact. Very, very important from a grassland point of view, that. Keep a, a close eye on wearing parts as metal wears back and it'll depend on the, the season, the soil conditions, the moisture levels. As metal starts to wear back, the geometry changes and with that you change the effect on the soil. So you'll get different effects as these wear back. They've got less lift height so that they're not going to do the same job. And this happens over a grad, gradually over a period of time. So it's important to check once in a while behind the machine regularly that you're still doing the job you think you're doing. And that's the best place to check it, really. If you, if you can perceive that the, the, the points have worn back, have a dig and just check you're still happy with the job you're doing. So we've got some examples of different points uh, that fit on these machines. This is a, just a different manufacturer's type of point. It does a very similar job. Uh, we're using it really to illustrate wear and keeping these tines effective. Once the point, the leading tip, wears back, and this one has worn back, once that wears back to a, a significant distance, then the action of the tip becomes the same as the wing, as opposed to being distinct out in front on its own. And when it becomes part of the wing, this radically increases the risk of bringing a lot of big cobbles to the surface, big clods to the surface. So it's important to try and maintain that leading tip well in front because then that does its opening action. It does the penetrating and leading action and the wing takes over and does the subtle lifting action to lift the soil so it can drop off the back and fail in tension and give you some vertical fissures through the profile. You can see the farmer in this case has welded some bits on there to, 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 to sort of offset the wear on the wings, but we haven't had the same effect on the tip and that, that will lead to a higher draft and, and a, a less effective operation. So we've looked so far at digging holes to assess the structure. Different parts of the field, very important. Possibly the most important time to dig a hole is when you've done the job to make sure it's done what you hope it has. So I've dug a couple of holes here uh, with the machine operating at two different speeds to show the differences in, in, in cultivating effect at depth. The hole just in front of me here, we're cultivating at, at uh, very slow speed, 4K. And you can probably appreciate here, we're not actually moving all of the soil at depth to a consistent level. There's, a, there's at least a 10 to 12 centimetre difference in depth between adjacent tine points. So contrast here to the hole that we've dug behind the machine when it was working at 10K. You can appreciate here, in between adjacent tines, we've moved a lot more of the soil to a consistent depth. The difference in depth between point position and, and midway is probably no more than three centimetres here. So we've done a much more consistent job by going that bit quicker uh, at the same settings for the machine. So moving on to the headland, deeper compaction, need to address it slightly, slightly differently, certainly to a greater depth. We left the machine set as we've done the, the, the central part of the field and are just looking at what it's done now through to depth. And you can see we haven't quite, we haven't moved all of the soil across the width by a long chalk. A lot of unmoved soil here. Whereas in, in the position where the tines have been, we've, we've done nearly an adequate depth, not quite. We could do with going that a little bit deeper because we, we've obviously got a deeper compaction here. So we basically, going to plan to do this operation in two passes because if we if we drop these tines deeper to the level we know the compactions at they're just going to cut an even steeper slot they're basically working nearly below their critical depth 
Uh, they are loosening effectively just here, but we're not getting that sideways movement. So the plan will be to, to cultivate it at a relatively shallow depth as we are here, number one, and then do a second pass at an angle across to take away this part and go progressively deeper so that we achieve the job in two passes. So second pass at an angle, drop the machine in, one hole on the machine. We've now achieved almost 30 centimetres deep as against 20 on the first pass, so extra 10 centimetres. And most significantly, we've now moved the, the soil profile to depth all the way across the width, done a nice consistent job right the way across, across the field. Okay, so we've got the the V-frame machine here is set to do in one pass full depth and you can probably just see in here the heave if you like the lifting effect between adjacent tines lifting all the way across uh, this is where the, the, the tractor wheel has gone it's lifted the whole profile so we, we, we're ensuring we're giving that that tensile failure that lifting effect to the soil and you can see it spreading out to the middle of this very very deep wheeling here as well so we're actually guaranteeing, if you like, that we've, we've moved the soil to the full width between adjacent tines, which is important, so we get maximum infiltration and the best structure. So looking at the surface effect that the tines have given, we talked about reducing surface disturbance where you probably want to, to minimise the effect of, of bringing up grass weeds. And you can see here the surface is more or less intact. OK, where the tines have been through, there's a bit of movement, but we've left the surface horizons on the surface and kept the buried ones underneath. We've just basically lifted the field. Okay, so just checking that we've moved all the ground to depth. You can see here... We've done just that where the tine has been and in between adjacent tines there at that point. And we, we've left quite strong structural blocks here which are capable of taking weight. They're capable of supporting axle load for the future passes. So rather than completely disrupt that profile, which does risk trafficking, pushing it back down and, and squeezing it badly, we've actually left little columns of harder soil here which there's plenty of capability for roots to get down between them and start to open them up but we've got some degree of support then for trafficking next time. It's a, it's a really classic example where metal can't actually completely solve the soil's problems by opening it up and giving it porosity. It's nature that's going to do that. But what we've done is given nature a chance to get in here now and start to open it up and do its work, but left us some supportive columns resembling subsoil column structure to enable us to traffic that land without risk of co compressing it down to worse than it was before. Just remember that the original ground level is probably at least 50 to 100 millimetres, 5 to 10 centimetres lower than the lifted profile that we've achieved with the machine. So you do, you do need to make a slight allowance for that. If you remember when we dug for a start, we, 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 we measured from original ground level to the depth of compaction. So here we need to add another, well, at least another 6, 7 centimetres onto that. Final point then, just check that you've reached the bottom of the compaction that we identified for a start and we've removed that. Always good just to check after the machine 
and make sure